when we spoke last night about the sufferings of Messiah, we'd just like to gather a few of those thoughts together. Because, brothers and sisters, it wasn't actual sins that worried Messiah very much. He didn't do any. But the effects of sin bore heavily upon him. And they bore more heavily upon him than any other man. And when we just think of the vicissitudes of life through which that man passed, the grief, and we know what grief can do. It's mentally debilitating. Did he ever lose control? Do we ever lose control? Think about sorrow. Sorrow, brethren and sisters, is daunting. But did he ever forfeit his trust in his God? Do we forfeit trust in our God? Would we, brethren and sisters, would we, older brethren and sisters, would we ever trade our retirement fund for three and a half years where a man didn't have a place to lay his head? Would we make a trade-off like that? What about the mockery and the reproach and the ridicule to which he was constantly open? It attacks the love of a man or a woman. Is he going to relinquish his love for his father? The answer is no. That man, brethren and sisters and young people, would trust his father in anything. And it went the other way as well because his father would trust him in anything. And they both trusted one another to the absolute ultimate degree. But what about us? Would we trade our bank balance? For trust in God? Do we actually believe that he will look after us, come what may? There are matters, brethren and sisters, in which the Lord Jesus Christ soars so far above us. Pain is blinding. But did he ever lose the vision of Yahweh at his right hand? The answer is no. To what can we put these extraordinary things? The uniqueness of his production. The uniqueness of his production and of that lovely pathos of his parenthood, of his father, daily opening his mind and stretching it as far as it would possibly be stretched. Now, brothers and sisters, we talk about a lot of things among ourselves. We know there are a lot of things that we must needs believe. But it happens to be my view that we have lost sight of what Diabolos is. Now that might sound funny coming from a Christadelphian. It might sound funny coming from a Christadelphian meeting that we've lost sight of what Diabolos is. And we sometimes need to refresh our minds about what diabolos is. We know that it is composed of two Greek words, dia and bolos, which together amounts to a false accuser. A diabolos, brethren and sisters and young people, is not a false accusation. It is a false accuser. And being a false accuser, the only thing that can emanate from it is falsity, falsehood. That's the only thing that can come from it. And there are only two powers. And the other power is the power of God through the influence of his word upon us. And that's why we read to open our considerations was Isaiah 55. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Because our thoughts, brethren and sisters, 
have one origin. And the origin is the false accuser. And the only thing that can emanate from that is falsity, falsehood. How dare we say that Jesus Christ ever gave rise to that? How dare we deny his origin to the extent when we would say that he must have had bad thoughts sometimes? To say that he had them, brethren and sisters, is to erode away his likeness of his father. To say that he couldn't have them is to erode the likeness that we have with him and which he got from his mother. The possibility was there, but it was never liberated in this man. And that is a towering distance between us and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, let's try and explain this. And we don't want to go into the details because we can't. They're too high for us. We can accept them, but we can't go into the details. But let us try to give an illustration. How many here have heard of Albert Einstein? I'm sure a lot of people have heard of Albert Einstein. Where would you put that man in relation to ourselves? Would you say he is on a status of his own? We would say he's in a status of his own. So far as records are concerned, there's almost none to match him. What's the difference between us and him? Not the stuff. We're all the same stuff as Jesus Christ was the same stuff as us. But status is another matter altogether. Now, brethren and sisters and young people, if you read up a little bit of medical science, you can find out that if we just take out one cubic inch of our brain, there are, so they say, 50,000 miles of fibre in one cubic inch of our brain. And the multiplicity of, con of connections that go to make up all the interconnectedness of the 100 million neurons that are in our brain is truly an amazing thing. The only difference, brethren and sisters, therefore must be the precision with which all those fibres and all those connections are made. And the Lord Jesus Christ would put Einstein in the shade. I once heard a brother say that if we have been given one or two or five talents, how many did he have? A million? Would that be conservative? That's the difference, brothers and sisters. To whom much is given, much is expected. And the expectation of God was met. He's told us what his expectation was. And we've seen the results in this extraordinary man. Brethren and sisters, there's some other matters that we have let go by so far in our considerations. Just think about the inspiration of this word. And sometimes a brother will stand up here and he'll say... Just have a look at the brilliance of the mind of the Apostle Paul. How did he work all that out? You know, he must have had an absolutely brilliant mind to work out what he writes in Romans and Hebrews and so on. It's got nothing to do with Paul's brilliance. It's got everything to do with the power of the Spirit. And we can very easily undermine the wonder of the inspired word by just shifting the emphasis. That's the doctrine of gradualism that's in the world today. They just shift the emphasis a little bit. And what do they wind up with? They wind up with the totality of denying the authority of God. And we need to be extremely careful that we do not fall into the same slide of gradualism. We want to say something else, brethren and sisters, because 
I have personally been accused of being a Trinitarian by a sister. That's a very sad thing. And it's all because we are dead scared of the Trinity. We are scared of it. It's not taught in the Bible. We know it's wrong. And as a matter of fact, class members, it is a very limiting doctrine because it parades the idea of one in three and three in one. And the doctrine of God manifestation delivers the idea of one in a million or more and a million in one. It's a very limiting idea is the doctrine of the Trinity apart from being wrong. God is a unity as we all very well know. And when we come to the Bible, we think that the Bible has to make plenty of declarations against the Trinity. No, it doesn't, brethren and sisters. We have to read the Bible because God gave it to us to declare his mind. And it's his mind that is the earnest business of our vocation to get alongside his mind and to think like him and to speak like him and to act like him. And that's the doctrine of God manifestation. And so, brethren and sisters, as we approach this subject this morning, the subject of the resurrection of Messiah, we might start off again by saying, was he actually raised? You know, it's a surprising thing to ask a group of Christadelphians, did Jesus Christ actually rise from the dead? And we'd all say, yes, of course he rose from the dead. Well, why would we ask such a simple question? It's a very daunting question for many people. Because if you believe in the immortality of the soul, how can a man die anyway? So it's impossible to be resurrected. And while it may seem a simple matter to us, it's not a simple matter to come to grips with if you've been taught something different. And it's the resurrection, brethren and sisters, that is an extremely important facet of God's work through Jesus Christ in matters related to the atonement. And we need to understand the whole picture. We need to be, under, be able to understand and to stand back and to look at the whole course of God's activity with this man so that we can really come to grips with what God has done and that the various phases of it were consequent upon the last one. And by the time we get to the end one, which is Christ sitting at the right hand of his Father, we then have a full picture. And you will find, both in the churches and among Christadelphians who are misled about the doctrine of the atonement, they will put everything on the death of Christ. It's all about his crucifixion. It's all about the blood shedding. It's all about his death. No, brethren and sisters. Essential as it was, it's but a link in the chain. And the link in the chain finishes up with our Lord Jesus Christ at his Father's right hand, there to appear in the presence of God for us. And if we leave out any of those departments, we have not seen what God did in his Son. So you will remember the words of the 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and at verse 17. We're not going to turn it up, but it says there, that if Christ be not raised, ye are yet in your sins. How important, therefore, is the resurrection? And now we'd just like to run back over the history of the doctrine of resurrection. For example, are you aware, brothers and sisters and young people, of how many times that word occurs in the Old Testament? That many. Not one. But it's clearly taught. And we have an example of it in the Old Testament history by the hand of Elisha the prophet. 
So it's very obvious that it was a doctrine. And it was very obvious in the mind of Abraham that when he was asked to go and to slay his only son on the Mount Moriah, the second time the angel appeared to him about when he was to plunge the knife into the, into the life of his son, the angel stopped him. And the inspired Apostle Paul makes a comment on that by saying that he received him from the dead in a figure. Even before that, Abraham had been promised that he would sleep for a long time. And in the fourth generation, his children would come back into this land in which he now dwelt. So he knew, brethren and sisters, that to occupy the promises, to be, for, to be given the promises, necessitated his resurrection from the dead. And the doctrine of resurrection in the Bible is founded upon the absolute necessity of the case. And that is an extremely sure foundation. Remember the promises made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. He would have pondered that and he would have been able to see according to the promises that he was going to see the time when his son and Lord would sit on his throne and he knew that it was in a long time to come. He believed in the doctrine of resurrection, even though the word was never said to him. He had to deduce it by the messages that were given. And he said, if, this is tr if my God is true, I can see there's only one end, and that is, I will have to be raised from the dead. And we could continue on in this vein for quite some while. But we want to put this picture into Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8 and at verse 34. And we read, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So when we sit back and we see those train of events, brethren and sisters, it's telling us something about the way in which the next step validated the one before. So that the effectiveness of the death of Christ only came into play when he was resurrected from the dead. And the effectiveness of that resurrection really only came into play when he ascended up to the right hand of his father there to make intercession for us. That's the complete train of events. And we must never give any less than that train of events. Any other system that focuses on any one of those three points and doesn't give the other their proper and due weight is a very great imbalance and a disregard for the principles of God. Now let us see what Psalm 30 says. Psalm 30, and we know it's a messianic psalm, it does talk about the pleasant theme of Israel's psalms. And it's a very prominent one in this regard. And verse 7 says, Yahweh, by thy favour thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face. When did Yahweh hide his face from his son? For three and a half days. He hid his face from his son. Not that that was a deliberate turning away from the son, brothers and sisters, but now... There's no light of the countenance of his son. It's gone into the grave for three and a half days. And so what verse 8 says, I cried to thee, O Yahweh, and unto Yahweh I made supplication. And it is now as if our Lord Jesus Christ is in the tomb and his father is hearing his voice. Of course, that's not literally true. 
But listen to the cry, brethren and sisters, that the son makes when he's in the, in the grave. And he says, what profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? What profit is there in my blood when I go down into the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Cannot thou see, O Father, that the time in which you allow me to stay in the grave, there's no possibility for me to carry on thy work? What a piercing cry, brethren and sisters. Could you resist that? Could you say to that son, I'm going to leave you there? A son that had never done you the slightest damage in all his life, he never betrayed you in any matter whatsoever. And you had actually spent 4,000 years of human history to develop the circumstances to a right situation when as a root out of a dry ground this man would come into existence by the express divine power working on the womb of a young woman, a virgin. Would you be able to shut your ears to a cry like that? And so, brothers and sisters, the resurrection took place. Now, this is a remarkable thing, a very remarkable thing, because, brothers and sisters, what did he do to deserve to die? Nothing. Nothing. Not the slightest thing, whatever, did he do to deserve to die. So why was he there? Why did he die? Because it's his natural inheritance from his father Adam. And as the first Adam went into the dust of the ground and because of his folly and his sin, he therefore decided the destiny of all his, of all his progeny. And he decided that they would all go into the grave. But he didn't decide they'd all go there forever. Because if he decided they'd all go there forever, the resurrection of Christ would have been impossible. And so would the resurrection of anybody else. Man was destined to go back to the dust of the earth from whence he came after sin came into the world, but it, didn't it, wasn't it wasn't covered by a clause which said forever. And so therefore, when we look at this man, brothers and sisters, We'll look at him through the eyes of the Spirit in Paul in Philippians chapter 2. And we've made reference to the status of this man. The stuff is the same as us. The status is the status of God. That's the status that that man enjoyed in his life. And we can read that because the Apostle Paul, under inspiration of God's Spirit, tells us that, that the, that's the case. Verse 5 of Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, and then we read that same little word again in verse 7, that he took upon him the form of a servant, so now the Spirit is making a contrast. It's making a contrast between the form of God and the form of a servant. We know that's the case, brothers and sisters, because the form of the servant and the form of God, if this is talking about his shape, it's the same shape. You do not contrast things that are the same. You only contrast things that are different. And so this man, we are told, has been in the form of God. Who being in the form of God. And the only other thing it can be, if it is not shape, has got to be his rank or his status. And when we see the thrust of this passage of the Holy Scriptures, brethren and sisters, 
it just, it just makes us cry. Because he was in the status of God, way above Einstein. Way above Einstein. Above the angels, above the archangels. That's his status. And he didn't have to grasp after that. He had it by birth. And that's what this passage is telling us. And it's all about the way in which Jesus Christ emptied himself. What did he empty himself of? He emptied himself of the status that he enjoyed by birth. And as we read through this passage, it says, Who being in the status of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You remember the scribes and Pharisees charged him of that charge? They said, you claim to be the son of God? You're claiming yourself to be equal with God. And brethren and sisters, in the properly understood sense, they were absolutely right. They were absolutely right that he was in the status of God. Of course, in the Trinitarian view, brethren, forget it. It's not talking about that. There is no equality in the Son as compared to his Father. There is no co-eternity in the Son as compared with his Father. But there was a connection in status. And that status had to go. What could he not have made use of about his status? What could he have done to all those who came before him Occupying that status. What an outlet for pride, brethren and sisters. And yet he says in Psalm 131, My heart is not haughty. I don't give myself to things that are too high for me. And now he says, in verse 7, But he made himself of no reputation the reputation that he could have enforced upon anybody and everybody, brothers and sisters, he gave it up completely. Now come to try to think out how difficult this would be. Who said, I am the bread of life? Who said, I am the light of the world? Who said, I am the resurrection and the life? Who said, you can't come unto the Father except you come by. What an outlet, what a possibility for pride. The man had no guile in his spirit. And this is telling us, this verse is telling us the extent to which this man was prepared to voluntarily give up all that status. And he took upon himself the status of a bond slave the lowest status that you can think of. But that wasn't enough. He then, we are told, he was obedient unto death. He was obedient unto death. It was a commandment of God that he give his life. And brethren and sisters, we cannot give something that is already forfeit by our inheritance because our inheritance is that we're going to die. And he had the same. He was going to die, come what may. But his father stopped that process in mid-age. And then it says that he was obedient unto death. So to be obedient, there must be a command. And John chapter 10 and verse 18 tells us. He said, I have got a commandment from my father that I must lay down my life. And I've also got a commandment from my father that I'm going to take it again. And brethren and sisters, this all means to us that the death that he was asked to die, that he was commanded to die, could not have been a natural death. 
because he's going to get that anyway. He's going to be asked to die something over and above natural death. And that's the only way he could possibly give it. Because to die naturally would have it taken away from him. But he gave it. And he gave it, brothers and sisters, to the very last expiry of breath on the tree. To the very last. He was in control of it. And if he wasn't, he couldn't have given it. But we know he gave it. And he didn't just die the death of natural death. He died even the death of the tree. The kind of death that was reserved to the lowest criminal. And he voluntarily gave up everything, brothers and sisters, that he could have claimed. And he died the death of the tree. If you were his father, could you leave him in the grave? It's not possible that the grave should hold that man. And it wasn't possible that the grave should hold that man. And he burst the bonds of death. And when you think about it, brethren and sisters, back in Psalm 16, which is our reading, God willing, for the meeting this morning, we come back to Psalm 16... And it lets us into a little secret. A secret, the value of which, the meaning of which, could not be possibly ascertained by David who wrote this psalm, who was the divine penman, whose heart was indicting a good matter, and he spoke of things touching the king, and his tongue was the pen of a ready writer. And it says in verse 9, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh shall also rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, brethren and sisters, if we were David penning those words, what would we understand by them? Would we be able to perceive down through the stream of time that there was going to be a man who would come out of the loins of David and be his Lord, as Psalm 110 says, and that he would grow into the grave and that he would only stay in there for a bit less than three and a half days because that's when corruption sets in? Would we be able to see that? <coughs> David would have been able to perceive that he was going to be a resurrected man, perhaps, but he could never have seen what we can see that the testimony of the New Testament says that he only stayed in the grave for three days and three nights but that's what that verse, verse says thou wilt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption corruption never set into his body and he was taken out of the grave by the power and the grace and the wisdom and the love of God because he could not suffer his holy one to see corruption. And they're the very words of Christ that he would have uttered, brethren and sisters. And the ears of his father would have been split open when he said those words. So we have a look again at Psalm 30. And Psalm 30 is very explicit. And the question that Messiah is asking in verse 9 is, what profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? What is the cause? What's the reason for me shedding blood if I am going to stay in the grave? Is a dead sacrifice of any use? Just the same as animals. Were they of any use? Really speaking, they were of no use. So if he's going to stay in the grave, brothers and sisters, the whole of his life up to that point when he expired on the tree is wasted. It didn't matter how perfect that man might be, if he was not a resurrected man, the whole influence of God, the total influence of God in his life for 33 and a half years was a dead issue. And the Apostle Peter calls it, doesn't he? He calls it the precious blood of Christ. 
Why was it precious? It's the same blood as ours. The same blood as anybody else's. Every human being had the same stuff in their veins. There might be different classes of it, but it's the same stuff. So what makes it precious? Well, it's precious, brothers and sisters, because it belonged to a man who was not produced in the normal way. Remember what we said about the four ways in which human beings have come into the world? There was Adam in the special way that he was made. There was Eve in the special way that she was made. There's all other mankind who have been produced by a combination of the will of the flesh on the mother's side and the will of the flesh on the father's side. And then there's our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's come into being by the direct effluence of God's Holy Spirit power. The eternal spirit clothed himself with the flesh of Mary. And we see a unique individual. And we see the flesh of that man, brothers and sisters, is different from us in stuff, no. In status, yes. Because the status of that man's flesh was completely pure of any thought or word or deed that would have done disservice to his father. And the status of that flesh and the status of that blood is therefore different. That's why it's precious. It was the precious blood of Christ. Not that the stuff itself is precious, but because it is related, it is the blood of a man who never upset his father in 33 and a half years. He never wavered. He never moved from the course that his father had laid out before him. And he had to come out of the grave. By the glory of God, as we are told in Romans chapter 6, the glory of God took him out of that grave. Now, is there any practical purposes for that? Yes, we'll come to Romans chapter 6, class members, because there is a very practical thing, a practical teaching that is associated with this matter of our Lord Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. And it's an amazing thing. It's in the chapter that talks about baptism. And baptism, as we know, is a typical death and a typical resurrection. It's not a real one because we don't actually die when we are baptised. But we renounce the power that always has motivated us before. The power of diabolos. We renounce it. And we say it's not going to hold us anymore. We want to do the very best we can in holding it at bay, not giving it any emanation. We're not going to allow it, as far as our desires are concerned, we're not going to allow it to emit any messages. And so in Romans chapter 6, it says in verse 3, Know ye not... That so many of us as were baptized into Christ, into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead. Now, did he really die? Well, people in the churches will tell you, no, he actually only swooned. And why? Because he's got an immortal soul, according to their view. He can't die, so he can't be raised either. But now, brothers and sisters, this is, what the re this is what this teaches. And it actually teaches that if Jesus Christ did not actually die, then the life that he now lives is only a continuation of his 33 and a half years in mortality. If he did not die. So that therefore means that if we submit ourselves to baptism, 
and we go through this ritual death and resurrection, the life that we live afterwards is only a continuation of the life we lived before. That's the practical outworking of this doctrine of the resurrection. It's got to be a death. It's got a repudiation of all the things for which we thought and spoke and did before. We bow down to the majesty called the Diabolos. And now we say we're going to live a new way of life. And we can see that this doctrine of the resurrection, brothers and sisters, has a lot to do with our practical application of life in the truth after we have gone through the waters of death and resurrection to a new way of life, not a continuation of our old life, a, a newness of life, and we've got to walk in that. Now, brothers and sisters, there's another factor here in the death and resurrection of Christ. Why was he not allowed to decay away? Why was it that he saw no corruption? It is common among us to say, oh, this body is only worthy of destruction. Think again. This body, brethren and sisters, is exactly the same body as God took out of the dust of the ground. It's exactly the same body. It's got a very different condition and therefore it's a different status than Adam when he was made of the dust. But this body is the very substance that God made to be a vehicle of his pleasure. It does not need to be destroyed. There are some people, the Apostle informs us, who will not sleep but will be changed. And that's what this body needs. The body doesn't need destruction. It has been given the brain and it has been given the external bodily features which if they are infused with the power of this word of God will make a vehicle in which he will ride to his own pleasure and glory. That's the doctrine of God manifestation. And this body does not need to dissolve away into dust. It does in many, many cases. But in the, in the case of Christ, he fell on sleep, but he saw no corruption, says the apostle in Acts chapter 13. He saw no corruption. Why? Because God wanted to clothe it with a new condition. And the new condition with which it was, was clothed is entirely compatible with the mind that was in it. And the mind that was in it was totally pleasing to the Father. And so it became clothed upon. He wasn't unclothed. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, read it for yourselves. He, Paul says we don't desire to be unclothed but we desire to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. And the house which is from heaven is the gift of everlasting life. And whether we need to be resurrected or not, brethren and sisters, is really incidental to that change. The promise of resurrection is a very important promise. Take away that hope from us and what is left? There's nothing left. And so the resurrection becomes an extremely important event in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll just close our considerations by looking again at Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8 and at verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God? making intercession for us. Brethren and sisters, the wondrous works of God in this man have got to be seen from the stand-back view.
we've got to survey all the matters that God performed. And to what extent was God in this man? Total. Total. What influence did he have in this man? Total. What part did he play in all of the facets of his life? Totally involved. Take God away, brothers and sisters, there's nothing left. There's only one thing in this world, there's only one thing that is ever worth saving. And you know the answer to that. It's God. God. 